Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. I'm Mike, your host. On Thursday, June 21st, I recorded the Counting to Five weekly live stream, which included, among other things, coverage of the court's five decisions on Monday, June 18th, and four new decisions on the morning of the 21st. Because of the length, I decided to split this live stream into two podcast episodes. In the last episode, I covered the court's five June 18th decisions, as well as other news and developments, including new cases granted for next term. And now, here's part two of the June 21st weekly live stream, which covers the court's four June 21st opinions. Um, the first case is a case called Pereira v. Sessions, and this is a, a rather technical immigration law case. It was an eight to one decision with Justice Sotomayor writing the majority, and the one justice in dissent was Justice Alito. But there's also a short but interesting concurrence by Justice Kennedy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, the the, the background of this case is there's a procedure when someone uh, when a a uh, a um, an immigrant a, a, a uh, alien is determined to be um, inadmissible or deportable. So someone someone is uh, removable from the United States for some reason. The attorney general has the, uh, in certain circumstances, can cancel the removal proceedings. They, so they can, they can uh, that's just referred to as cancellation. Um, but there's a, a, a requirement before someone is even eligible for consideration by the attorney general, they have to meet this requirement of having been 10, ten having 10 years of continuous presence in the United States. So um, if someone has been here for more than 10 years, they can apply for cancellation. Now, here's the thing. There's a provision um, uh, under under the, the cancellation provision. Uh, here, here's part of the statutory language. It says, quote, when the alien is served a notice to appear under section 1229A of this title, and then it basically says that the clock stops for purposes of that 10 years of continuous presence requirement. So that notice of to appear is when someone has been, uh, when a, um, an, a, uh, a non-citizen is being, um, uh, proceedings are beginning against them to remove them from the country. So a notice to appear is issued uh, telling them that these proceedings are being initiated. And this provision, the statute of provision says that that clock that, that, that where, where someone is, is supposed to, is, needs 10 years of continuous presence to be, el to be eligible for cancellation, that clock stops once the government starts proceedings. And the purpose of this was it was supposed to prevent immigrants from trying to deliberately delay immigration proceedings in order to um, to run up the time to get to the 10 years where they might be eligible. So say someone had been in the country for eight years, they get served with a notice that they're going to be, uh, there's going to be removal proceedings. They might do everything they can, uh, all kinds of delaying tactics to try and stretch it out for another two years, hoping that once they're past 10 years, they can um, seek cancellation. So what this says is once that notice happens, the time stops. So if it's been eight years and you receive that notice, your time is up, you, you didn't hit 10 years, it doesn't matter how long the proceedings last, you, you, you never meet that 10 year requirement. Now, the issue here is that um, the, the particular section it refers to, it referred to when someone is served and noticed to appear under section 1229A. Now, Section 1229A refers to uh, written notice, and the quote is, written notice in this section referred to as a notice to appear shall be given in person to the alien, and there's some more things. And it says it specifies various things, various requirements. And one of the things that's specified according to 1229A is the time and place at which the removal proceedings will be held. Okay, so let me, let me uh, that's with the statutory background there. Let me move on to the specific facts of this case. The uh, Pereira, that's, uh, uh, Wesley Pereira, um, entered the United States in the year 2000. Now, he was served with the notice to appear, this is for removal proceedings, in 2006. However, his notice to appear did not include a date or time of the removal proceedings. It was to be determined at some future time. Now, eventually, he was detained by the Department of Homeland Security in 2013, um, where they went forward with removal proceedings. He applied for cancellation. At that point in 2013, he'd been in the country for more than 10 years. He, uh, he, he believed he would be eligible to seek cancellation of his removal. He's now married uh, and has two U.S. citizen children. Um, but uh, the uh, immigration judge ruled that his... Um, he was not eligible because the 2006 notice to appear stopped the clock. So he only had you know six years or so of time. He didn't meet that 10-year requirement. So the question is, did that notice 
serve to stop the clock when it didn't include certain of the requirement required elements of the notice to appear, specifically the, the time, the date and time of removal proceedings. Now, the Department of Homeland Security has a regular routine practice of sending notices without any date or time. Now, apparently it's nearly 100% of the notices they send, these initial notices to appear, do not include the date or time, often don't include the place, it's just to be determined. Uh, according to the Department of Homeland Security, this is enough to stop the clock. They'll follow up later um, with uh, with deport deportation proceedings and they'll update the date and time. Um, but they say that initial notice, even if it doesn't to contain the data in time, that's enough to stop the clock. Now, Pereira argued in this case, the statute was clear. If there's no date and time, that doesn't count as a valid notice to appear. The clock doesn't stop running. So, so Justice Sotomayor wrote the eight justice majority opinion. And she says, here's a quote. A notice that does not inform a non-citizen when and where to appear for removal proceedings is not a notice to appear under section 1229A. So that's just the, 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 the blunt uh, holding of the case. And, and, um, and she, she argues here that the statute is clear and unambiguous. She says there's no need for any deference to the attorney general's interpretation here in this case. Uh, this is referring to a concept known as Chevron deference, and I'm gonna come back to that in a few minutes, but just to move on. She says, this provision is a definitional provision. It says, the type of notice refer, referred to as a notice of, it says, it's referred to as a notice of appear, notice to appear, um, and and then it, and then it specifies uh, what, what it includes. That's that's definitional language that's often used in statutes to kind of define a term. So it, it's saying that a notice to appear is basically defined as a document that includes the following information. So therefore, a document not including that following information is definitionally not a notice to appear. So it's not a notice to appear under 1229A that would stop the clock. Um, and she notes a few things. She says there's a separate provision that governs notices to. Um, change or postpone proceedings to a new time or place. And that seems to um, imply, uh, it assumes that the original notice must have set a time or place in the first place. For this. So that's just com confirms the understanding that the notice to appear is, you know, statutorily is, should have set that time and place. Um, and uh, she also relies not just on, on that uh, kind of specific definition, but the common sense meaning of the, just the phrase notice to appear. And she says, if something's a notice for someone to appear, at the very minimum, it has to say when and where someone is required to appear. Um, and then uh, she responds uh, to some other things. She says the, 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 the stop time provision refers to a notice to appear under section 1229A. Um, and she says that the most natural reading of the term under here is under is a word that is kind of uh, may mean different things in different contexts. But she says here, the most natural reading is it means in accordance with. So it's saying a notice to appear basically in accordance with 1229A, which defines a notice to appear. And she also um, refers to some, some uh, practical concerns. Uh, right now, there's basically no coordination between the different branches of the federal government that are involved in sending out these notices to appear and actually scheduling uh, immigration proceedings. But she says there's just no reason to believe the government couldn't basically get its act together and schedule dates in advance if it needed to. Uh, and that the court shouldn't assume that the government would just, um, uh, would would just if, if it was forced to have dates and times that would just include arbitrary dates and times, there's no reason to assume that the government wouldn't get its act together if it was kind of um, made to by the court. And she also points to the statutory purpose. As, as I mentioned before, the purpose of this stop time provision was to prevent immigrants from gaming the system by deliberately delaying proceedings. But here, the date and time are completely within the government's control. So there's no concern of the immigrant gaming the system. So she says, she just, on all those, for all those reasons, she says that, that, that uh, this was not a valid notice to appear. Now, Justice Alito, I mentioned dissents. And he rests his dissent largely on a concept called Chevron deference. And this is, this is a, a, uh, uh, Chevron deference is a concept that goes back to a case from the 1980s um, referred to as Chevron. Um, it's Chevron versus National Resources Defense Council. And um, it, that, the standard that was uh, established in that case was um, that when, when, a, when a statute passed by Congress is um, in some way unclear or uh, ambiguous or vague, um, then if a the administrative agency that is charged with um, administering that statute um, issues a uh, regulation or, or a rule that that um, that uh, interprets that statute, then uh, the courts are supposed to defer to that interpretation as long as it's a reasonable interpretation. 
of the statute. That's the basic basic idea behind behind Chevron. Now it's it's uh, become a, a somewhat controversial um, um, doctrine, and and interestingly, the the uh, the the usual um, uh, partisan lineup uh, on Chevron doctrine is is flipped in the, in this particular case because it's usually usually um, uh, the most cr critics of the Chevron doctrine in recent years are uh, from the conservative side with uh, the more liberal liberal side being more uh, in defense of the Chevron doctrine. But here is Justice Alito standing as the defender of uh, Chevron doctrine in, in this in this particular case. And he accuses the majority of basically ignoring Chevron in this case. Um, he says he, he basically um, says that there are clear ambiguities in this particular case, um, and that should put it into the, the realm of Chevron, where where you, where the court should be deferring to the attorney general's um, interpretation of it. And here's here's just the way he frames it. He says, "Is a notice to appear a document that contains certain essential characteristics, namely all the information required by 1229A1, so that any notice that omits any of the information is not a notice to appear at all?" Or is a notice to appear a document that is conventionally called by that name so that a notice that omits some of the information required by 1229A1 may still be regarded as a notice to appear? So that's him kind of setting up what he sees as the ambiguity in this case. And he says that basically under Chevron, the government's interpretation need only be reasonable, not the best possible interpretation, just a reasonable interpretation um, of the statutory language at issue. And he argues that the government's interpretation is consistent with the stop time rule. He says that the the, the phrase uh, notice to appear under section 1229A should be interpreted to mean authorized by 1229A. So it's a type of notice that is authorized under that provision, not that it um, conforms to that definitional requirement of that provision. Um, he notes also that it cites broadly to 1229A, which is a broader provision dealing with notice notices to appear or notice it doesn't cite the specific provision 1229a1 that has those that list of various requirements for notice that's the what, what was characterized by the majority as definitional and kind of points to that as saying that it's not intending to just incorporate that definition it's just saying something that's authorized under this provision um and he also points to another um uh, uh fact that he thinks lean like supports his his uh his reading he says that Congress um, uh, also, after it enacted the stop time rule, it uh, passed a provision that, that applied this stop time rule retroactively to orders to show cause that were issued before the stop time rule was enacted. So before this rule was enacted, the court wasn't issue or the the government wasn't issuing notices to appear before they were issuing orders to show cause, which were basically charging documents that indicated to someone that they were uh, in violation of the immigration laws and subject to deportation. And so the court, the Congress said when they passed the stop time rule that for um, orders to show cause issued before the stop time rule was enacted, um, they should be uh, they should be deemed to stop the time. And Alito says, well, those orders to show cause, they don't have uh, a requirement of showing of listing the time and place. But Congress basically treated them as equivalent to notices of, to appear for purposes of the stop time rule. Um, so it shows that Congress really didn't place a, a significance on time and place that the majority is placing there. He also talks about the practical con consequences here, notes that it's two different um, branches of the federal government. It's the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, that issues these, these notices to appear. But it's the DOJ, the Department of Justice's immigration court, that coordinates, that uh, handles actual scheduling of, of de deportation removal proceedings. Um, and, and the two don't coordinate on scheduling. Um, so he argues that here, requiring DHS to put dates on these things would end up being no better than rough guesses, which would end up um, being routinely uh, changed later. And that's no benefit to anyone. Um, so uh, he, he also he also argues uh, he, against the, the common sense view that the majority uses saying that a notice to appear must um, provide the information of where and when to appear. He says that despite the name, the name notice to appear, the actual purpose of these notices to appear is is as a charging document, similar to the old orders to show cause. It's basically just to, to tell someone that they're being charged with this uh, violation of the immigration laws and they're subject to removal. Um, and that's that's what's really significant about them. And he says, given this ambiguity, these different ways to read the statute, Chevron, the Chevron doctrine requires deference to the government's interpretation. Um, and he ends with a little bit of sarcasm here. He says, here's a quote, but unless the court has overruled Chevron in a secret decision that has somehow escaped my attention, it remains good law. So it's kind of uh, digging the majority for in his, in his uh, um, 
reading uh, not correctly applying Chevron. Now, this is where it's interesting. Justice Kennedy had a short concurrence, and he's basically directly uh, replying to Justice Alito on the Chevron point, but he doesn't directly mention Justice Alito's dissent at all. But uh, that, that seems, seems to be the implication here. He notes instead, he points to um, six of the courts of appeals below that found this document, th this uh, statutory um, scheme ambiguous and applied Chevron and gave Chevron deference to the attorney general's interpretation. And Kennedy criticizes these lower courts for failing to properly apply the first step of Chevron, which is to determine whether there really is an ambiguity or whether the, the, the statutory language actually clearly resolves the, the question at issue. And he, he here's a quote here. He says, the type of reflexive deference exhibited in some of these cases is troubling. But he also, he also goes on, and this has gotten a lot of attention just since this morning when this case was issued, he calls for reconsidering Chevron and its application uh, in some future case. And this is something, again, that's been on the conservative side of the, the uh, um, legal uh, world. This is something that's been a, a common refrain in recent years that Chevron should be um, reconsidered uh, in, in a major way. But here, Kennedy's giving some weight to that. So that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, so moving on, the next case, a case called Wisconsin Central Limited v. United States. This is a case about the scope of the Railroad Retirement Tax Act, referred to as the RRTA. Now, this was a five to four decision. Now, this one split along the kind of stereotypical conservative liberal lines. Justice Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion and Justice Breyer wrote the dissent. And this case, I'll try and go quickly through this. Uh, it's kind of a very narrow case. It deals with a, a, a statute. It's an alternative to the normal uh, FICA statute, the, the Social Security taxes that most people pay on their uh, on their, um, their their salary and, and wages. Uh, instead, employees of railroads pay under a separate, different Great Depression era statute called the Railroad Retirement Tax Act. It's similar to the FICA, to the FICA Social Security tax, but there's some different language in certain areas, and the specific language here is relating to what. Um, is the basis for for the the tax uh, under the social, under FICA the Social Security tax? It applies to wages, and those are defined broadly to include all remuneration for employment, including the cash value of all remuneration, including benefits paid in any medium other than cash. So very broad. The Railroad um, Tax Act, a uh, Railroad Retirement Tax Act, on the other hand, is requires a, a tax on. A, 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 poor, a percentage of employee compensation, but then defines compensation as, quote, money remuneration. Now, the question here is, what about stock options? Are stock options money remuneration? The railroads here sued for a refund of taxes they'd paid on exercise stock options by their employees. And so the question here is, do our stock options money remuneration under the Railroad Tax Act, Railroad Retirement Tax Act? Justice Gorsuch writes for the majority, and he says at the time this was enacted, back in 1937, money uh, commonly referred to currency. Um, and he says that uh, this this act was intended to mirror the um, private pension practices at the time, which generally only included uh, uh, pension contributions on the basis of uh, money, salary, and not things like in-kind benefits. He says stock options, although they're readily convertible to cash, they're not a standard medium of exchange and therefore they're not money. So this is not money remuneration. And he points to some near contemporaneous um, other uh, provisions of federal law, including a 1939 um, Internal Revenue Code that treats money and stock as distinct categories, and also the Social Security um, uh, the FICA Act, which was adopted at the same time period and uses broader language um, than, than this act to say that basically the, the different language used in these different acts should, should um, cause the courts to treat them differently. Um, and uh, he, he, he says that the government's interpretation, anything convertible into money that can be valued in cash, that has no real limit and would pull in all kinds of in-kind benefits that, that this uh, um, provision was explicitly intended to exclude. Um, and, and the government, uh, according to Gorsuch, the government can't successfully explain why such a different language was used in uh, FICA or the 1939 Internal Revenue Code if, um, if the, they were all supposed to cover basically um, the same things. Um, and he also briefly talks about Chevron deference, uh, the thing, we, the concept we just talked about in the, uh, the, the last case. And, and it specifically talks to a recent IRS interpretation um, that treats uh, compensation as having the same meaning as the term wages in FICA, quote, except as specifically limited by the Railroad Retirement Tax Act. And he first says, 
first, this is not ambiguous. He says money remuneration just isn't ambiguous in this context. We know what money means. Therefore, Chevron deference doesn't apply. But then he says, even if it did, this language, ex except as specifically limited by the Railroad Retirement Tax Act, he says, well, the word money is a specific limitation on remuneration in that tax act. So it is different from FICA. Um, so that that doesn't uh, answer the, 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 uh, the question here. That brings me to the dissent by Justice Breyer. Um, Ju Justice Breyer uh, takes the, uh, the, the, the opposite position and, and points out the practical effect here. He says that a large number of these stock options, the, the, uh, the people holding these options do what's known as a cashless exercise, where they purchase um, at the option price with an immediate sale at market price, and, and they just um, get the, the difference in, in those two prices. So essentially, they never actually hold the stock that the option is attached to. They just get cash in the bank. And and he's making the point that it's basically economically equivalent to cash. So it doesn't make any sense to treat these stock options differently when from the employee's perspective, it's just money in the bank. Um, and he goes and cites some competing dictionary entry, entries uh, that have a broader definition of money and, uh, and says that this is basically ambiguous, but that the better reading um, is the one that uh, would be broad enough to encompass stock options. And he points to the purposes of this act. He said it was meant to exclude certain difficult to value in-kind benefits. Uh, well, thank you for the, those of you who are still with me. Thanks for your indulgence. I know this is running long and I'm sorry for the technical issues, but let me just continue. Um, I had been uh, speaking on the, uh, the uh, case about the Railroad Retirement Tax Act, and I'll just wrap that up quickly. So Justice Breyer in dissent had basically concluded that the better interpretation um, of the term money remuneration was broad enough to encompass um, stock options. And he specifically, uh, he also uh, touched on the issue of Chevron deference, the concept I, I talked about in the last case, um, saying that, that to the extent it was ambiguous, the term money remuneration, the agency interpretation is reasonable. And so the court should defer to that. So uh, that brings me on to the next case. We've got two cases left. I'll try and run through these pretty quickly, but these are the two of the bigger cases. Uh, okay, two more cases to cover. One is a case called uh, Lucia v. SEC. Now, uh, this is a case that's about the constitutionality of the appointment of the SEC, that's the Security and Exchange Commission's administrative law judges, referred to as ALJs for short. Now, this was a seven to two decision. Now, Justice Kagan wrote the majority opinion and she was joined by the five uh, more conservative members of the court. Now, Justice Breyer also um, was with the majority he, but he had a he concurred um, in the judgment in part. So he he wrote a separate opinion. He disagrees with the reasoning of the majority, and but uh, but comes to the same result. Um, Justice Thomas also had a uh, uh, his own short concurrence joined by Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Sotomayor was in dissent joined by Justice Ginsburg. So let me give a little background on this particular case. So the Constitution establishes. Uh, particular methods of appointing officers of the United States. There's different methods depending on whether they're what's known as principal officers or inferior officers. But here's the language. It says, the president shall nominate and buy in with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint and various things. And it says, all other of officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law but the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. So, so basically, it establishes two separate categories of officers, the, what's known as principal officers and inferior officers. It says that principal officers have to be appointed by the president, but it says that inferior officers, Congress can by law have those inferior officers appointed by the president or optionally by the heads of departments. Now, there's a different category of, uh, of uh, federal government um, personnel who are just referred to as employees. Now, employees are a separate category from these officers of the United States. And employees are generally just hired through uh, normal civil service hiring processes. They're not appointed through these appointment processes. Now, there have been some cases that challenge this line between what's a principal officer and an inferior officer. But here, the question is the line between officers and mere employees. And the challenge here is to the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC's administrative law judges. judges. Now, there are uh, ALJs in, uh, in a number of agencies. They're not judicial officers. They're, they're agency officials, but they have a judge-like um, position. They, they oversee trial-like adjudications. So SEC ALJs, 
they work for the Securities and Exchange Commission and they conduct um, adjudications that are very trial-like within the SEC. The issue here is that the ALJs are not selected by the commission itself. Now, the SEC, the commissioners of the SEC, the commission, is deemed the head of the department for the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's the head of the department. So under this constitutional provision, if the administrative law judges were um, inferior officers, they could be appointed by the commission itself. But they're not appointed that way. Instead, they're selected by certain SEC staff, not the commission di directly. At least they were. Uh, this has changed since then, but they were at the time that's relevant to this case. They're selected by SEC staff. Now, the, the in this particular case, the, the, the individual involved, Lucia, was an investment professional who had been charged by the SEC with fraud due to uh, presentations to potential clients. And he was tried before the security, uh, the SEC ALJ, and he was found guilty. And there's pretty severe consequences. He was stripped of his license in the securities industry. He was barred from the industry and he had a substantial monetary fine. Now he argues, uh, he has argued that the charges against him were flawed and unfair, but the, the challenge here is a constitutional challenge. He says this ALJ, because it's an officer of the United States, that the ALJ was an officer of the United States, but was not appointed according to the constitutional requirements, that this was an unconstitutional um, uh, appointment, and so th th his adjudication was under an unconstitutionally appointed uh, officer of the United States. Now, Justice Kagan writes the majority uh, opinion in this case and finds that, in fact, this ALJ was not constitutionally appointed, agrees with the challenge and says that this was unconstitutional appointment. And he, her opinion is, is pretty uh, straight into the, uh, short and to the point. She says, the ALJ has extensive powers that are comparable to a district judge conduct conducting a bench trial. And she points to the key precedent here is a case called Freitag v. Commissioner, a 1991 Supreme Court case. Now, that case dealt with what are known as special trial judges or STJs of the United States Tax Court. And there... They, those judges, the, the special trial judges, they presided over hearings, but they could not issue final decisions in major cases. However, the court in that case found that these STJs exercised significant authority that was enough to make them officers. Specifically, they took testimony, conducted trials, ruled on the admissibility of evidence, and they have the power to enforce compliance with discovery orders. Um, and so the court found that in the course of carrying out these important functions, the STJs exercised significant discretion. So these are some criteria that the court found was important that made them officers. And Kagan basically says ALJs exercise basically the same authority as the STJs. They take testimony, they conduct trials, they rule on the admissibility of evidence, all these same things. They have significant um, discretion. Um, she points to one difference, but says it's not particularly significant. The STJs, the ones in the pre previous uh, opinion, um, their opinions were always reviewed by a tax court judge um, uh, after they were made. Now, the ALJ opinions in the SEC, they become final only when they, they, they're subject to review by the, the SEC, by the commission, um, and, and they become final when the commission either reviews them or declines to review them, then they, they, they can become final. Um, but Justice Kagan said that's, uh, the, the, that's not uh, a crucial difference. They both have uh, very similar um, authorities. And so because the Freitag case decided these STJs were inferior officers, it follows that these ALJs are also inferior, office, inferior officers and therefore were not constitutionally appointed. Now, um, she moves on to discuss the remedial a remedial issue. And by that, I mean, okay, so they're unconstitutionally appointed. What do you do about it now? This this uh, adjudication happened under an unconstitutionally appointed judge. What do you do? Well, importantly, since that time, the SEC went back and they did what they, they referred to as ratifying the previous appointments. And they basically were kind of um, saying that they were reappointing these ALJs uh, the same ALJs that had been appointed by SEC staff are now appointed by the commission itself. And so they say this should cure all problems. Now our ALJs are constitutionally appointed. Justice Kagan says that the appropriate rem remedy is a new hearing before a constitutionally appointed official. But she further says it should not be the same ALJ that heard the case originally. She says, because, quote, he cannot be expected to consider the matter as though he had not adjudicated it before. Um, so, so the end result is that, that uh, Lucia, the, the um, petitioner in this case, um, uh, the majority says Lucia should, should, should get a brand new adjudication in front of a brand new ALJ.
Um, Kagan does say in footnotes that this isn't an absolute rule, that, that uh, here it's appropriate because there's other ALJs available who could hear the case. It might not be appropriate to require a different adjudicator if it was a situation where there just wasn't someone else available that could, could, uh, could um, serve that role. Um, and the court doesn't touch the issue of the legality of the SEC's ratification of prior unconstitutional appointments. It leaves that as an open, open issue that could potentially be challenged or decided later. Um, so moving on to Justice Thomas uh, writes a concurrence here. Now, Justice Thomas agrees that the authority uh, in the from the Freitag case, the, the type of authority that the uh, that, that uh, was determined to make someone an officer in the Freitag case is sufficient to make someone an officer. Um, but Thomas says that the court should do more to specify because this 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 case doesn't really advance the uh, the case law as far as making it more clear uh, for for um, federal uh, officials who are, who, are, who are different in significant ways from the ALJs or from the Freitag uh, um, judges. Um, it gives very little guidance on what the standards are. And Thomas says the court should do more to define what are the necessary conditions to make someone an officer. And he goes, uh, gives his own uh, um, explanation there. He kind of goes into a historical inquiry and his, his, um, his opinion is, is heavily reliant on an amicus brief and some scholarship of a law professor named Jennifer Mascott. And, uh, and he, he uh, adopts a standard where he says, basically, all federal civil officials who perform an ongoing statutory duty, no matter how important or significant the duty, um, th those people are all officers under his definition. He says this was the, the ordinary meaning of the term officer was just anyone who performed a continuous public duty and, uh, and officer of the United States just meant a, a federal officer uh, of the federal government. And he says this standard, under this standard, the ALJ is easily qualified under, under this standard. But, but this is a potentially radical change that would turn a huge number of federal employees who are currently just deemed employees into officers under this definition. It's just a, it's an interesting um, um, concurrence that, that, that takes this pretty radical view, but there's, there's no, uh, no evidence that uh, the that, uh, larger uh, um, portion of the court has any uh, interest in, in uh, adopting a standard like that. However, again, the majority leaves it wide open what the actual standard is for things that are significantly different from the ALJs. Um, that moves, brings me to Justice Breyer's concurrence. Now, Justice Breyer, argues, uh, the, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but he says this constitutional issue, the issue of the constitutionality of the appointment, he believes this can't be correctly decided without also deciding an issue about the constitutionality of restrictions on removal of these ALJs. And the court had explicitly decided not to take up this removal issue um, that, that the, the government had actually asked the court to decide the removal issue also. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute to try and explain what Justice Breyer is, is getting at here. But Justice Breyer decides the case on a very different grounds. He says there's a statutory ground for this decision. And he looks to the Administrative Procedure Act. Now, the Administrative Procedure Act, which is referred to as the APA for short, is a major federal statute that sets the general ground rules for federal administrative agencies. Now, uh, it, 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 and here's language from the APA. It says, quote, each agency shall appoint as many administrative law judges as are necessary for hearings and, and hearings governed by the APA, basically. And he says, in this case, the agency means the commission. And so it said the commission shall appoint, the commission didn't appoint these justices, these ALJs. And he says, there's no statutory authority for them delegating this appointment to um, someone else in the commission. Um, and and so the so it just it just fails to meet the requirement of the APA in the first place, and it, this should just be decided on this pure statutory grounds. And he says this is this is the preferred method of deciding this because it avoids difficult constitutional questions of officers versus employees, um, and it's uh, enough to just decide it on the statutory grounds. Now here's 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 where he, he discusses in more depth why he thinks the removal issue that the court didn't decide here is relevant, and this comes down to a a. Uh, a Supreme Court decision from a few years back called Free Enterprise Fund v. Public County uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, and that that was a, a case that was challenging this uh, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which is a, a federal um, uh, uh, agency, and the, the the court held in that case that um, the because of the the Constitution's grant of the executive power. Um, to the president of the United States, that, that the Constitution was violated if there was too much insulation 
of um, of officers, of executive officers from r removal by the president of the United States. In that case, it involved um, officers who had uh, uh, what was referred to as double for cause removal, where where um, those officers could only be removed for cause by a superior officer who in turn could only be removed for cause by the president. And the court said that this type of insulation from um, uh, political control by the president was too much and uh, violated the Constitution. Now, that decision was limited to officers. It didn't decide the case for um, for employees. Uh, it just it decided that it, it left open whether there was any whether uh, any similar um, restrictions applied to employees. But it said for officers at least this uh, this type of insulation was unconstitutional. Now Breyer points out here that these ALJs, the ALJs at issue in this case, are similarly insulated for, from removal. Um, but he, he points out that the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, was designed, it was intended to protect the ALJ's independence. There's a reason they have this protection. It's to protect their independence because you want adjudicators, people acting as judges, to be independent from politics. But what he argues here, and this is the interesting argument, he says, if these ALJs fit within the scope of the Free Enterprise Fund ruling, that ruling about the the, the, the uh, unconstitutional um, protections against removal, if they fit within that framework, so that they would be similarly unconstitutional, if they were officers, they would be similarly, uh, it would be unconstitutional for them to have that removal protection. Then, then this would destroy ALJ independence. And he says that this is contrary to Congress's intent. Congress clearly wanted these uh, ALJs to be independent. And therefore, he would infer from this that Congress had no intention to make ALJs officers of the United States. And so this is the interesting piece here. It's kind of reasoning backwards um, from that from that conclusion. But he argues that the Constitution should be interpreted to give Congress a, a significant amount of leeway to determine whether a particular individual is an officer versus an employee. And and given that he thinks that that is at least to some significant degree in Congress's hands, the fact that Congress wanted them to be independent and the fact that if they were officers, they would lose their independence um, would be grounds for thinking that 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 uh, that Congress had actually um, made them uh, just employees. So it's, it's an interesting. It's a very different uh, style of reasoning um, from uh, from the majority. Um, now he he goes on uh, to to discuss a, a, a very separate issue um, in his opinion also, and this is the remedial question where the majority said that uh, when this gets sent back, a different ALJ should hear the case. Breyer disagrees with that. He says that there's really no reason the original ALJ shouldn't be able to rehear the case now that they're constitutionally appointed. He compares this to uh, a district judge after an opinion is reversed on appeal, where the case normally goes back to the same judge, and he says that there's no structural protections are violated now that this is now that the problem is cured and for that narrow portion the remedial question he's actually joined by the dissenters justices ginsburg and sotomayor who say well if, if this is going to be um remanded uh, they agree that it can go back to the same alj now that brings me to the dissent so this is justice sotomayor in dissent and she basically complains about the majority's lack of guidance on the officer question uh the lack of guidance in the court's prior cases about who is or is not an officer um, and she she points to the precedent, says that there's there's uh, two particular criteria. One is um, continuing office established by law, which exists here, but the other is the exercise of significant authority. And she argues that one prerequisite to finding that someone exercises significant authority is that they have the ability to make final binding decisions on behalf of the government. Um, she says someone that makes just recommendations to another government or another another officer who exercises their own authority, that's not enough. And she cites to some um, some earlier legal sources that suggest that an officer is someone who has a delegated portion of sovereign authority, uh, allowing them to bind the rights of others. Um, and then she goes to, and looks at these ALJs and says, despite their extensive powers, they on their own cannot bind parties to their decisions. All of their decisions are subject to review by the commission. And even when the commission declines to review, they must issue what's known as a finality order before the ALJs um, uh, uh, decisions actually take effect. So the ALJs on their own cannot bind anyone. It's only through the commission that they bind anyone. So she says it just doesn't mean it. Therefore, they're not officers. And that's uh, the end of her decision there. Now, this is interesting because 
as far as the SEC is concerned, this case is probably going to have very little impact. The SEC doesn't have doesn't have many ALJs. They already reappointed them in in what they uh, is presumably a constitutional fashion, and most um, cases decided uh, before uh, under the previous unconstitutional. Um, uh, appointments, most of those cases didn't raise this issue and therefore they've probably waived it and have no right to reopen those cases. So it doesn't matter much for the SEC, but this could have a much more significant um, impact elsewhere. There are more than a thousand ALJs across various agencies across the government. Some agencies have numerous ALJs and uh, it's a it's an open question how many decisions are potentially out there under these ALJs in other, um, other agencies that may not have been appointed um, by the uh, head of the agency that, that may be subject to challenge now. Um, but there are also a significant number of other adjudicatory officials. There, are, uh, For example, there are some uh, officials known as um, administrative judges, not administrative law judges, ALJs, but just AJs. And uh, by some counts, there's more than 10,000 of those in various agencies, and they have a lot of the same powers and could potentially fall under this decision as well. Um, so it's it's an open question of how much of an impact this case may have, and it just remains to be seen in future. There, there will undoubtedly be um, future challenges to uh, various federal officials. And again, it's still a wide open question beyond these adjudicatory officials who are very similar to ALJs, um, what types of other federal um, uh, federal uh, agents, employees are actually constitutional officers? Um, it's still still an open question. That brings me to the last case of the night. I'm sorry this has run so long, but let's just finish it out. The last case is South Dakota v. Wayfair. And this is the case about the authority of states to force out-of-state retailers to collect sales tax. And this came down with a five to four decision. Justice Kennedy wrote the majority, joined by Thomas, Ginsburg, Alito, and Gorsuch. So it's a little bit of a mixed group. It's four of the conservatives along with Ginsburg. Justice Thomas wrote a concurrence. Justice Gorsuch wrote a concurrence. And then there's a dissent by Justice Roberts, who's joined by Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. So again, it's Roberts joined by three of the, the liberal justices. So another slightly unusual combination. Here's a quick background. The, the key case here, there's a 1992 case called Quill Corp v. North Dakota. And in that case, the court held that states can't require a retailer with no physical presence in the state to collect state sales tax. And this in turn was based on a 1967 case called um, uh, National Bellis Hess v. Department of Revenue. And, and th this, these cases are, are, are based on something known as the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is also referred to sometimes as the Negative Commerce Clause. And it's the idea that um, the Commerce Clause is, a, is a, a portion of the federal constitution that gives the federal government the authority to regulate interstate commerce. Now, the Dormer Com Commerce Clause is, is, is a, it's an idea, it's a concept that the, it's an implication from the Commerce Clause that states, because this, uh, this authority is given to the federal government, that states cannot impede interstate commerce, even if Congress hasn't acted. So it's, it's the idea that Commerce Clause, by implication, places some limits on what states can do that has an impact on interstate commerce. Um, so the, the, the issue here is that South Dakota, this Quill case, the 1992 case, um, is, is very unpopular among state governments who would like to impose taxes on out-of-state retailers that are selling into their state. Um, South Dakota passed a law to specifically challenge the Quill rule. So passed a law, and a number of other states have done the same thing to some greater or lesser degree. South Dakota passed a very restrained law to try and try and uh, make it a test case. It only applies to large retailers, retailers that have more than $100,000 in sales or more than 200 individual sales inside South Dakota. So it won't burden businesses that have a very small South Dakota footprint. And it also prohibits retroactive application. So it only apply going forward. And South Dakota basically argues that the quill is just outdated, it should be overruled. The argument on the other side is that there's just uh, a large part of the argument is there's just a very strong value in adhering to the court's precedent and not going and overturning a rule that's been in place for such a long time. So Justice Kennedy wrote the majority. And he starts with a kind of a historical review of the court's Commerce Clause case law. And he notes that states and the federal government have concurrent authority to regulate commerce. Um, but he notes there's two principles that are bounding state's authority, the limiting the state's authority. Now here, he's referring to this, the, the court's dormant commerce clause or negative commerce clause um, doctrines, but he doesn't ever use those terms in his opinion. It's kind of, he only refers to it as the commerce clause generally. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, just um, stylistic choice of his. But he points to these two limits on state authority. One of them is that a state cannot discriminate against interstate commerce. 
And the second one, this is the more important one, is the state cannot impose undue burdens on interstate commerce. So uh, a state's uh, um, regulation of interstate commerce will be upheld unless it, the, the burden it imposes is clearly excessive in relation to the, the, the local benefits of, uh, of that um, regulation. That's the, that's the basic Commerce Clause principles. Now, he looks, he points at the Bellis Hess case, that's the 1967 case that dealt with mail order retailers and said they had to have a physical presence in the state in order, for, in order to be uh, forced to collect sales tax. Um, but he, he, he that, that's the, the precedent that Quill later relied on. He points to a later case, a 1977 case called Complete Auto, which is the key dormant commerce clause case dealing with state taxing authority. And that case uh, established a test for when a state can tax interstate commerce. And, and it's basically a four part test. It says first, it has to apply to an activity with a substantial nexus with the taxing state. So there has to be a, a substantial connection to the state in order for them to apply this tax. Two, it has to be fairly apportioned. Three, it does not discriminate against interstate commerce. And four, it's fairly related to the services the state provides. So that's, that's kind of the, the main precedent for state taxes. But then Quill comes along in 1992 and the Quill case acknowledged that it was arguably inconsistent with the Bellis Hess, the Bellis Hess case, the, the, the earlier 1967 case was arguably inconsistent with complete auto which set this taxing rule. But it 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 uh, it um, continued the 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 rule. It upheld the Bellis Hess rule requiring a physical presence and kind of equated that physical presence with the substantial nexus requirement in the complete auto case. So that brings us to uh, that's Kennedy's kind of brief uh, review of the the major precedents in this area, and that brings him to the case for overruling Quill. And he kind of runs through a number of reasons. He says, first, physical presence is not necessary for substantial nexus. Substantial nexus is generally considered to be related to due process concerns, that there's enough of a connection with the state that there's some uh, uh, real authority for the state to be regulating some particular entity. And he says there's well-settled precedent that state authority can extend to out-of-state parties that don't have a physical presence. And that also physical presence is not really related to compliance burden, just because uh, some uh, entity has some small physical presence in a particular state doesn't really relieve all of the burden that they they have of complying with the state's tax uh, requirements. So it's not a good fit. Then he says that the Quill rule actually creates market distortions. It puts local businesses and, and those national businesses that have a physical presence at a disadvantage to these um, uh, out-of-state uh, businesses without a physical presence who can uh, uh, who don't have to charge the sales tax. And it also creates a perverse incentive for businesses not to create a physical presence inside states where they otherwise might because they don't want to subject themselves to the, uh, the tax collection uh, responsibility. And also he says it imp imposes arbitrary formalistic distinctions. They, they, you may have economically and uh, very similar situ similarly situated businesses and they differ only based on the location of a particular warehouse and that causes them to be treated differently um, for, for these tax purposes. And he also notes, he says that the internet really undermines the physical presence line. He says there's some real questions about what me what physical presence means when you're dealing with uh, the internet. Is a website um, viewed on a customer's computer, uh, is that a physical presence in the state? What if that website places uh, tracking cookies, so that's uh, files on a uh, uh, end user's computer that allow it to, uh, to, uh, to track a particular user? What about an app that's downloaded to a customer's phone? Is that create a phys does that create a physical presence? And, and uh, uh, so, so he, he says the internet kind of undermines this. And also the, the physical presence rule isn't a good match to the, the, the reach of internet businesses. Many internet businesses have a, a very vast um, uh, uh, reach uh, the, the kind of the scope of, of who they touch um, that, that is completely uh, s distinct from their actual physical presence. And, um, and finally, he says that this rule is just a, a huge burden on state governments. So then he addresses the issue of, uh, of, of precedent. So stare decisis, that's just a fancy legal term for, for abiding by prior precedents, the, the, the concept that, that uh, courts should stick with, with. There's a value to adhering to precedents, even if, uh, even if they may not be um, ideal or, or correct as an original matter. But he argues here that, um, that, that uh, although Congress is in a position to uh, 
so the, an interesting thing, this is an interesting thing about the dormant commerce clause jurisprudence. The commerce clause, the idea that, the, that Congress has the power to regulate commerce, that's a constitutional rule that d defines the, the, the scope of Congress's authority, and it's not within Congress's power to change. Dormant commerce clause is a little bit different. <clears throat> it, it, it creates a constitutional default that says that um, where Congress hasn't acted, there are things that the states are forbidden for, for, from doing. But that's just a default. The Congress can always step in and allow states to act in those areas. So it's kind of a different situation. And in this way, um, um, there's the, uh, some, some argue that <clears throat> for, for those purposes, the Dormant Commerce Clause should be considered very similar to a statutory situation, a situation of, a situation of statutory law. And there's, a, there's a, um, a distinction that's often drawn for purposes of precedent between constitutional rules and statutory rules, where the courts are the only ones who can overrule an incorrect constitutional decision. But in theory, an incorrect statutory decision can always be overruled by Congress at some later date. So this is often used to justify a much stronger version of precedent for statutory rulings, because the idea is Congress can always step in and fix it so the courts don't need to go back on their prior decisions. And the argument is made often that that same principle should apply in the Dormant Commerce Clause space because Congress is free to step in and change. Um, they change things. Kennedy disputes this basically saying, while Congress can change in this case, the physical presence rule, it can't change this constitutional default. And as long as this constitutional default is in the case law, the courts should step in and change that because that's, that's, a, that's a rule that only the courts can, can deal with. And he, he goes on to say, the, these earlier cases, uh, Bellis, Hess, and Quill, they never anticipated the explosion of e-commerce. And the fact that that happened and completely changed the uh, the uh, retailing landscape really undermines the, the value of those precedents. And then he points to real problems that are caused by the physical presence standard. He says that state laws, uh, there's state laws that are kind of creatively defining physical and physical presence to include you know, digital um, things like those, like downloading an app, as I mentioned. There's efforts by states to impose paperwork requirements on, on out of state sellers that don't actually require them to collect taxes. Um, but but there's all these workarounds that states are trying to 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 use to to be able to uh, effectively collect these taxes, um, and and so these these problems kind of undermine the idea that there that that there's a lot of interest in relying on these previous precedents. And then he points to he uh, um, he addresses a concern about practical problems with this. Uh, there's there was a lot of concern about the uh, the burden that this rule might create on retailers who would suddenly have to deal with the, all the various different tax rules in all the different jurisdictions across the country. Um, but Kennedy is fairly confident that software solutions will emerge that will make this a much more, more manageable problem. And he also points out that if there are bigger problems, Congress can always step in to try and alleviate those problems. So that's that's the majority. So moving on quickly, there are two concurrences, short concurrences by Thomas and Gorsuch. Now, Thomas is interesting. He was on the court at the time of Quill, and he specifically writes to say that he basically regrets his vote in Quill to stick with the Bellis Hess rule and says he should have uh, joined the one justice who dissented uh, and and, uh, and voted to overrule Bellis Hess at the time. Um, but he goes on to, and this is a position he's staked out in previous opinions before, but he basically rejects the court's entire dormant commerce clause jurisprudence. Um, he, he argues that if Congress hasn't acted in an area, the states are free to act. And the whole idea that there's just these zones where even if Congress has done nothing, the states are not free to go. That's a, a, a mistake that the courts uh, invented out of whole cloth and should be done away with. Now, Justice Gorsuch has a concurrence that's on a somewhat similar vein. He agrees with the majority that the Dormous Com Dormant Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence doesn't justify the Quill rule, so he agrees that it should be overruled. But he calls for reconsideration of the entire Dormant Commerce Clause um, area. Now, unlike Thomas, he he leaves open the possibility that um, that some or, or at least some at least some part of the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence may be in some way justifiable, possibly under different rationales than the court has used previously used. He leaves that open as a possibility, um, but he thinks the court should really revisit the whole area. So let's move on and try and wrap this up with the dissent in this case. And again, that's Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts writing the dissent here. And his dissent is heavily reliant on star, stare decisis, this idea that uh, the court should uh, adhere to its prior precedents and that there's a heavy burden to overturn a prior precedent. He interestingly agrees that the Bellis Hess case, the 1967 case that started this whole physical presence requirement, he agrees that that was wrongly decided. It should have been decided the other way at the time. But then he points to the growth of e-commerce 
uh, with this as the backdrop and 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 says that just that is the the world that we've lived in for all this time and any change to the rule now could cause huge disruptions um and he, he says, and he says, and I, I mentioned this in speak in talking about Kennedy's opinion. He believes the dormant commerce clause should get the heightened type of sorry decisis like statutes get because Congress is always free to step in. And he points to the fact that this is something that Congress has actively considered over the years. Congress has been actively considering some uh, overturning quill in some way, um, and there are actually currently three bills pending in Congress uh, that would, uh, in some way, overturn the quill rule. And Roberts kind of argues that, that this decision may have the effect of basically torpedoing that legislation because by suddenly changing the baseline, it, it just upsets all of the uh, legislative kind of um, negotiations and expectations and the kind of uh, finely crafted compromises that the Congress may have come up with to deal with the various concerns in this area now uh, won't happen, at least in the short term, because of the court stepping in uh, to, uh, to, to uh, change the rule. He also argues that, um, contrary to the majority, there's really no urgency for the court to act in this area. He says the majority talks a lot about the expansion of e-commerce, the vast expansion of e-commerce, but he says they ignore the fact that an increasing amount of e-commerce uh, is uh, uh, taxes are su successfully being collected by states. There's estimates that approximately 80% of sales taxes on e-commerce are currently being uh, um collected. A lot of this is due to compliance by some of the largest vendors. And, and that's an interesting point about this case. Um, there's an assumption often that it's uh, things like Amazon um, that are most affected by this, but Amazon actually already collects sales tax in every jurisdiction, every taxing jurisdiction, um, just as a matter of its, its own policy. And that's true of many of the largest retailers, either because they have a physical presence everywhere, like Walmart, for example, or just in enough jurisdictions that they find it a uh, better policy just to comply everywhere like Amazon. Um, so, so Robert says there's, there's actually increasing compliance due to these large vendors with physical presence in a lot of places. So it's really not it's this major um, urgency to act quickly on this. And then he emphasizes this heavy compliance burden, especially on small businesses, and notes that there's the, at least the claims are that the software to deal with this um, especially for small vendors, is still in its infancy, and it's questionable how accurate or uh, cost of, uh, affordable um, it is. And uh, he, he just goes back to Congress again, saying that Congress has much more flexibility to take into account all of the varied interests and to craft a, a, uh, uh, a careful rule in this area. So that uh, that does it for um, uh, this week's uh, cases. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'll give a little wrap up. If anyone is still watching live and have any last questions, uh, uh, feel free to enter them in and kind of a last call for questions. But otherwise, that brings us to the end of this live stream episode. The next live stream will be a week from today, Thursday, June 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And you can always check the Counting to Five YouTube channel to find the next scheduled live stream. Now, next week's live stream, after issuing this morning's opinion, the court announced that it would take the bench again tomorrow. That's Friday the 22nd. Uh, at 10 a.m. to issue additional opinions. Now, the court also had its private conference earlier today. The orders list from that conference will come out Monday morning at 9.30, and more opinions are also expected Monday at 10. So we have opinions tomorrow, Friday at 10 a.m., Monday at 10 a.m. We don't know yet whether Monday will be the last day of the term or if the court will schedule additional opinion hand-down days. If it does add another day, Tuesday or Wednesday are good bets because at this point, the justices are eager to finish so they can start their summer recess. Um, but at least we'll have some opinions coming down Friday and Monday, and then uh, we'll, we'll see when they actually get the last of them out. Now, as a reminder, 10 cases are still pending, and this includes several major cases, including Carpenter v. U.S. That's the case about uh, whether the government needs a warrant to obtain cell site location data. Uh, NIFLA v. Becerra, that's a case about the California FACT Act, which is a uh, um, uh, requires uh, certain disclosures about the availability of abortion by crisis uh, pregnancy centers. Janice v. Asks Me, which is um, the uh, case about uh, union collective bargaining fees. And Trump v. Hawaii, which is the travel ban litigation, the highly anticipated case about the, uh, um, the, the ban on entry of nationals of certain countries. So um, I, there's a suggestion in the live stream, maybe break it up into two episodes instead of one. I, I, I may try to do this. This was awful long. It was, it was uh, even longer than I, I uh, anticipated. Um, so I might try and do that. It just, it's just going to depend on exactly when the opinions come down and, and frankly, just whether I have time to uh, 
to uh, read and process them um, in, in time uh, before uh, I, I have limited uh, time in which to do that. So uh, I, 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 I don't know um, how feasible. I know I can uh, I can get through everything by Thursday, but I'm not sure uh, how much I'll be able to get through earlier in the week if I want to do two. It's a good suggestion, and I'm, I'll think about that. But uh, as of now, I'm planning to just do Thursday. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but that wraps it up for tonight. Uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio podcast, I would love your feedback. You can leave comments on the show notes at counting to five.com on the counting to five YouTube channel or Facebook page. You can tweet at counting to five or send an email to Mike at counting to five.com. Please subscribe to the counting to five YouTube channel or audio podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Thank you for listening. This has been counting to five.